Like most World War II veterans, my dad didn't talk a lot about the war. Growing up, I knew the basics. I knew he was a B-17 pilot. His plane was named the Susan Ruth. He flew bombing missions over occupied Europe. And on February 8th, 1944, his plane was shot down. I had a wonderful relationship with my father. He was a tough guy, you know, kind of a no-nonsense guy. We compared him to John Wayne. He was that type of character. My parents grew up in an area with tough times. They went through the Depression, and they were tough people as a result of that. World War II came along, and there was no other event in history that affected more people. When Japan bombed Pearl Harbor on December 7th, the country rallied. They believed in their cause, and they were willing to sacrifice all to achieve victory. Flying combat was incredibly dangerous. The average number of missions flown before being shot down was six. For these guys to keep going up, you know, on mission after mission, knowing that the next one could be their last, took a lot of bravery and a lot of guts. I got shot down on my eighth mission. I was up in the air, and two fun wolves came in, and they shot the heck out of us. And they came in about one o'clock. They just made one pass, and everything blew up. Two of my men were killed in the plane. Two evaded capture. I was one of them, and my tail gunner was the other one. And then three of them got down safely, but they were picked up by the Germans, and they were interrogated, and then they were marched out in the woods and shot in the back of the head. Three Belgian farmers saw the chute open, and they came running over, and they threw me a rope, pulled me up to the tree, and got me out of the tree. Then one of them took me off into the woods and hid me. They were different personalities, of course. Some of them were brave, some of them were scared to death. The ones that were scared of hiding you, why, they, they, they moved you pretty quick. The ones that didn't, uh, weren't scared, I mean, you might stay there six weeks. They risked not only their lives, but the lives of their family and friends. If the German secret police, the Gestapo, found out about it, they'd be arrested, tortured, and either sent to a concentration camp or shot. And some of the people that helped my dad and, and his other members of the crew met that fate. Word came that the Allies had landed at Normandy on June 6th, so he knew they'd be coming up through France to liberate that area. His Belgium helpers accompanied him over the Belgian border into France and joined up with a unit of the French resistance called the Mackie. They would disrupt communication, sabotage railroad lines, uh, attack convoys, assassinate German officers. And so he fought with them for uh, a couple months. The very first hours of the uh, 2nd of September 1944, few jeeps uh, of the reconnaissance party of the 60th Infantry Regiment crossed the border and there the Belgian population were waiting for, for the liberators. They were waiting that for four long years and uh, they saw the liberators coming in and uh, they were waving, they had uh, flowers. It was very uh, happy days for the old people of Belgium. Word came that there were uh, U.S. troops in a nearby village of Trelon, France. So he walked into the village, into the town square, up to an uh, army major. My dad identified it himself, and that ended his seven months of missing in action. The Belgian people saw firsthand the atrocities committed by the Nazis. To this day, they are so grateful and so thankful still for the Americans coming to their rescue and liberating them from Nazi oppression. My father, Paul Delahaye, started the Belgian-American Foundation in 1984. It was for the 40th anniversary of the liberation of Belgium. The GIs who had been killed deserved the right to, to, uh, to be honored and to, to receive homage from us because they gave their life for, for us. Every year they have ceremonies at these various memorials that they've erected in the area on the anniversary date of those events. But the big celebrations are always on September 2nd, the anniversary date of the liberation of Belgium. 
Your father came the first time in 1988. I remember him when he came the, the, the first time because we were very young, so that was the Americans. We had never seen Americans, you know, <laughs> so that was a bit crazy. In 1994, I took my first trip to Belgium uh, with my parents. There was an event. There were hundreds of people in this hall, and we were a little late arriving. My dad walked in, and the entire place stood up and started applauding, and it was really moving. You know, they treated him like he was the president of the United States. It, I have never forget it. I got a whole new appreciation for my dad, because, you know, I knew these stories, but, you know, you hear the stories, but, you know, they're not that personal to you. But when you're there, and you've seen these places where the events took place, they've been in rooms where my dad was hidden. Thing that he was right here, he climbed out this window to get up on this roof. You know, the history is preserved right there. The locals really saved my dad's life. It's a war we fought together. He came here to liberate my country. Why wouldn't I help him? I corresponded with him from the time I got back to the States until they died. They're wonderful people. They're brave people. I mean, they risk their life to keep you from being captured. My parents had kept a lot of material from the war. There were two items that were really significant. One was a diary that my dad wrote while he was missing in action. And the other item were all the letters that my dad wrote to my mother during the war that she had kept. And sitting down one time, spending several hours reading these letters, and I just became fascinated with the story of my dad and his crew, and it became my passion. I just came to the conclusion that the story of my dad and his crew was so unique and so compelling that it needed to be told. People needed to hear about it, and so I decided to write a book. Shot Down focuses on one crew and what happened to each member of that crew. That it just makes for a fascinating story, one that hasn't been told. All that the U.S. military knew was that my dad's plane was shot down by two Falk Wolf German fighters, and I just assumed that's all I'd ever know. One day, during my research, my wife Glenda said, why don't you try to find the German pilot that shot him down? But like a good husband, I did what she told me to do, and I found Hans Berger. He's 95 years old now. He lives in Munich, Germany. Here's a picture this is of a Hans. Picture of... Well, that's pretty neat. There's your plane, your picture, yeah. and your autograph. The young people of today, they have no idea what our life was, what the time was, what, uh, what difficulties we had, and that we were not all evil Nazis, but we were people like you and me, and uh, we just grew up in, in different spheres. On this 8th day of February, your father and me met, <laughs> and we shot each other down. <laughs> I've been asked several times, like, well, don't you hate this guy that shot down your dad's plane? But uh, no. Well, good for you. It keeps... From the very get-go, I felt a personal relationship with Hans. He was 20 years old. He was fighting for his country, just trying to do a job and trying to stay alive. And World War II was the defining moment in my father's life. Really, I think it's the defining moment for any guy's life who fought in World War II. This... Yeah. And Hans is a part of my dad's life, a part of uh, his story. And so I had no ill feelings toward Hans, and uh, we become friends. Never thought that I'd meet the, the son of a guy I shut down. Yeah, well, I never thought I'd meet you either. Incredible. <laughs>
I didn't do all this while he was still living. We had a deep respect for the American troops who came and helped us. We know that if they didn't, the world wouldn't be the same today. I'm trying to do now the same with my kids. So I'd like them to, to learn about that and first to learn respect towards the American who came and, and did it and sacrificed for us. I do think that we own them liberty. We, it's the less we can do. Uh, it's try to make sure they will never be forgotten. As World War II fades in the memory, people lose sight of what took place, what that generation fought for. Because you know, the old expression, if you don't learn from history, you're gonna repeat it. They say that for a reason. So it gives you appreciation for your freedom and maybe a better appreciation for the people that serve and gives a, a better appreciation and value for your country. So that, that's really one of the reasons why I do what I do is to try to keep the memory uh, alive.